All right, so we're going to continue on the uh, file systems today. All right, so last uh, session we talked about file allocation method. We uh, learned how the, uh, fi how the operating system basically allocates file on the disk blocks with uh, contiguous linked index. Uh, allocation methods, we also learned about the free space management, uh, which is uh, how the operating system manages the free spaces and free blocks and then, uh, you know, uses them later. So that it does with uh, using linked lists uh, or free lists, bit vector, grouping, and counting. And uh, so you were supposed to basically finish up a syscall handler by this point. Uh, and if you are not done with the argument passing and uh, syscall handler, um, again, you might have a bit of an obstacle. So make sure you make up for it during the weekend. Before argument passing and syscall handler, it's like, you know, the, you're ramping up. If you do so, then implementing syscalls will be much easier. So, you know, you're putting up a lot of effort, but if you're not done with them, not so many pass uh, tests you can pass. All right, so uh, do it over the weekend. Uh, there have been, like, you know, good discussions and questions on Piazza. Use them. And also, uh, I want to see more peer answers. I don't see a lot of, like, peer answers on Piazza, right? So if there's a question you know the answer to, please go ahead. Uh, I have seen, like, very useful things. Uh, but it's just like the numbers are not very much. All right. Uh, all right. So, so today first we're gonna just uh, clear up a little bit of a confusion that last session was caused uh, in the index allocation address translation. I, I made a, like a calculation mistake there. I just wanted to make it clear. And also the free space management of grouping uh, versus counting. Uh, so grouping that does not necessarily need to be contiguous. And then we're gonna go over the file control block, how the directories are structured and implemented. And we're going to talk a little bit about inodes and soft links and hard uh, links in Unix. All right. So last session, uh, we brought this up uh, about uh, index allocation address. And for that, we meant that, okay, we're going to like hold an index table in one separate block for each file. And then that index uh, block actually links to the data blocks to a file. So this way, we can uh, have larger files, I mean, larger than, you know, one block, basically. Uh, so we're going to talk about just like that and then see, like in the slides, it says like 256 kilobytes of uh, maximum file size if you have like one block for index table. But uh, during last lec uh, lecture, I, like on the uh, Blackboard, I calculated 16, which was just like off too much, right? And the reason uh, we're going to just cover, all right? Uh, before that, yes, I'm just going to do it on the... I'm going to do it quick. All right. So, uh, we have like one block index and two block index, right? And then in the end. So, if you have one block index, that means, you remember, our blocks are 512 bytes. So, that means we have like a hundred and, uh, 512 entries from zero to 511. This is in case we have each entry is using a pointer of size 1, right? Because we have 512 bytes, and if you, you can address, like if you can use one pointer per a byte, or one byte per pointer, then you can actually have like 512 pointers, right? And that is 512 entries, which is 2 to the power of 9. And again, I'll just write it down. This is 1 byte per pointer. In last lecture, I talked about 4 bytes per pointer. Right? So in that case, your entries will be 128, which up to, I mean, up to this point, we were right. Now, then we said, now, each of these pointers are pointing to a data block of size 512 bytes, right? So each of these pointers, no matter what's the size, they point to 512 bytes of data, which is, again, 2 to the power of 9. So, if you multiply this by this, if you have a one-byte pointer scheme, if you have like a one block index, then you have 512 entries, each leading to 512 bytes. So, you have 2 to the power of 9 multiplied 2 to the power of 9, 2 to the power of 18, which is uh, 2 to the power, like 256 
k. How to calculate that? Well, 2 to the power of 10 is 1,000, or like 1k, 2 to the power of 20 will be 1 meg. This is two orders, uh, like 2 to the power of 2 less than that, which is like 1 fourth of a megabyte, which is 2 to the power of, uh, sorry, 256 kilobyte, which is in the lecture, right? Because we, in the lecture example, we have assumed that there is one byte pointer. In this case, the same thing happens, like we have less entries, but still each entry is pointing to a 512 bytes. So the data in each block is still there. So, again, up to this point, we were correct, but I just like uh, uh, added these up to 14, which was wrong. These will be actually to the power of 16, and this is 64 kilobytes of data. And obviously, if you have like four bytes per entry, then the number of points, uh, like blocks that you can index is like one fourth. And that's why like you, you have actually uh, the maximum size of a, your file will be one fourth of this case, right? So it's just like, uh, it depends on the number of bytes per pointer. Uh, in the example in the lecture, it's one byte. So that's why the maximum file is there. If you have four bytes, that will be the case. If you have like two level indexing, then that would be 64 to the power of 2 or 2 to the power of 32, which is 4 gigabytes, again, mentioned in the, uh, as an actual example in the lecture, right? And if you have two block index, not two level indexing, just two blocks, you are just doubling the number of entries, right? You're just attaching this block to this block. So instead of like 512 entries in this case, you have uh, 1,024. In that, in that case, instead of like 128, you'll have 256. You just like double the file size, uh, file size. So this will be like, you know, 512K, and then this will be 128K. The number actually here is not, it's just like too specific. It doesn't matter. It depends on what scheme you implement, what number of bytes is each pointer. You know, you should just like be able to work it out, you know, like that. Okay? Let's go back to next one, which is grouping. So grouping and uh, bit vector list, I think it was like clear. So for the bit vector, we're just going to keep, uh, you know, 32 kilobytes of uh, just like zeros and ones um, for a block size of uh, the disk size of one gigabyte. Um, and you just realize how we can just like calculate and it's easy to get contiguous files. So the free list, which, uh, which for each of them, we actually uh, hold the link to the next free block at the start of the disk free block. And then, you know, because of that, we have to s traverse the disk blocks to find next free blocks, okay? Um, so we, we, see, we saw why it's bad. Now, the grouping was a modification of the free list, so it still saves the, uh, you know, the next free blocks into the first free block. However, it doesn't have to be contiguous. That was just a bit of a confusion. So it stores like n free blocks, but uh, it, it's just like grouping all the free blocks. So instead of like jumping through the blocks, I'm gonna uh, we're gonna see it in the uh, picture. Uh, but they, they don't have to be contiguous. So you know, in the first free block, it says, okay, the next four blocks that are free are number two, number twenty, number thirty. Counting, on the other hand, it doesn't store like that. It doesn't store the free blocks, you know, on the, on the blocks themselves, like, link, uh, like the linked list. It, it just keeps a table of free, contiguous free blocks. So it says, okay, we have four free blocks, one after another, starting at this address, all right? So let's take a look at this. So uh, in the counting scheme, it says, okay, I have... Uh, Three blocks, three free blocks contiguous starting at block number one. So that means starting from block number one, I have one, two, and three free blocks. Then the next uh, batch of free blocks will start at address seven, and again, there are still three. And so starting from address seven, I have like one, two, three after another. Why do I don't, why I don't use this, right? So the next batch starts at 12 and the size is just like 1. So here. And then next batch is starting at number 14 and the length or the number of them is 5. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 
So this way, by looking at these, you don't have to traverse the blocks anymore. As long as you load these data in, you can just like, you know, uh, process them in memory and then realize, okay, if I want three blocks of contiguous, if I want to like, you know, assign what it, for whatever is in contiguous blocks to one file, I cannot like fit it here. I can fit it here, here, here. So I choose this one. Right? You don't have to actually traverse the blocks to get these information. Grouping is just a modification of the free list. So you still have to probably traverse. But instead of traversing like block one by one just like that, looking at number one, you realize that, okay, next three blocks are two, three, and seven. Okay, now if I want to jump to the next three blocks, I don't have to actually traverse on the disk to number two, three, and seven. I just like skip two and three. I just like go to the seven to see what's going on. So in the seven, it is written. The next three blocks are... 8, 9, and 12. So, again, I don't have to traverse these blocks. If I want to see what are the next three blocks, I just jump from 7 to 12 directly. So this way, you're just skipping some of the uh, you know, block readings on the disk. Sorry? But again, it doesn't have to be uh, contiguous. So on number 7, it says that, okay, next three blocks are 8, 9, and 12. That's it. It's just like the, how you actually do it as the free list. Okay? So... Moving on to file system. So what is a file system? This is today's uh, discussion. So a file system is part of the OS that is an interface between the user and actual files. And it handles, you know, uh, how to organize and uh, access the files on the storage, right? So uh, it basically gives the user the primitives such as, you know, you've seen them, right? You know, open, create a file, remove a file, uh, write to a file, read it from a file. And uh, so what it does, uh, I mean, th there are a lot of things that it does. So first of all, it, uh, for example, improves the I.O. efficiency. So even if you tell the file system, hey, I want to read one byte or, you know, I want to write so many file, uh, bytes, it kind of caches and handles that instead of like every, for every byte accessing the disk. Uh, it basically does the I.O. of the units of blocks because that's what the hard disks do. So if you ask the hard disk, they can actually, you know, uh, they have a buffer. So it utilizes all of this, and then, again, it's like all, uh, removes all of this uh, from the user space. So, you know, the user view doesn't see any of these. And uh, also it uh, ensures, you know, the integrity of the data. So the file system itself has self-recovery, it has journalism, for example, uh, to prevent, you know, corruption of data, the user, again, you don't have to do any of these in the user level. It, it is being done if you shut down your computer, you restart it, it figures out what was the point. Uh, and in a lot of cases, it has like, you know, swap files or whatever that, you know, allows this, stores extra recovery information. All right? So, again, file system just like gives uh, an efficient uh, access to data to the user. So, how does it do it? So, in order to do this, uh, it handles uh, through a file control block. So, for each file, there's a file control block um, that, again, it should be stored. Now, in each control block, the operating system stores some information. So, for example, what are the permissions of this file? Who can access this file? So that, you know, for security, right? So, the users cannot, like, access each other's files. So, what are the dates? Like, when was this file created? When was it, like, accessed? When it was modified? These are, again, like, kept in the file control block because these are actually useful whenever you want to, like, see if a file has changed or whether, uh, you know, uh, if, when, when was the file? So, you're looking for something, right? So, who is the owner of this file? No matter what the permissions say, but who actually owns it, right? Uh, if you do, like, LS in your uh, Ubuntu, actually, it will say, like, you know, the owner and the groups. Uh, in a lot of like you know personal computers, you you probably have like one user and you only have like one group. But think of it as a multi-user. If you have like you know thousands of users, there are like groups. For example, faculties, staff, students, grads, undergrads, and then you know again for each of them there are like thousands of uh, uh, yeah. What is this? Uh, I just forgot the word. Right. So there are like thousands of the students. Each of them have. Uh, one of their own, right? So, and then what is the size of the file and actually where the file is, the data block starts, where are they on the uh, file desk? So, these are all kept in the file control block itself, right? Oh, the word was user, all right? So, now, 
how it handles and organizes this is through directories. So what is a directory? Like you, you all used it, but what is essentially a directory is that the, the operating system just introduces directories as a uh, kind of, again, an abstract, just to help you organize and to access files, you know, uh, through path file names, you know, uh, allow you to have multi-level uh, directories and have, you know, different files, but with the same name at different locations. And it does it through uh, something uh, which is, again, a directory itself is a, like a file, but it has just like meta information. Right? So instead of like actually holding like you know, text information or video information, a directory is also a file, but it stores information that allows the operating system to treat it as it's like, you know, files are located in a hierarchical, you know, order, which is basically not true. Like each file is essentially somewhere on the hard disk, which is accessible directly, and it's just like that directory helps it traverse where each, uh, each of these files are, and it's, it helps because uh, you can group files together. Now they have like logical meaning, right? So, uh, for example, you, you've all, I guess you all have seen like how these directories are working, right? There are hierarchies, hierarchies. So starting from the slash, which is the root, uh, then you know there are directories, directories within directories, and so on, right? And how it does it is just like each of them is a separate file, so this user USR is a file, the local is a file, and then user has a link to local. So when you actually go into the user, you actually see the directories. We're gonna see how, how they're structured, right? So <clears throat> the directory itself, the file that we call directory, is just like a list of the file names or directory names and their attributes. Right? So, for example, in, the, in your home, in your Pintos directory, let's say, uh, Pintos itself is a file, but it has the met meta information that I am a directory. I'm not a you know, text file, I'm a directory. So that way, operating system, when it looks at it, it says, okay, now what information, useful information you can give me. Then it says, okay, I have uh, a file in, um, under you know, the, this folder or directory, which is called SRC. Uh, I have another one which is called doc. I have like a file which is called make file, right? And then this way, and uh, the name of the files and their locations will basically uh, allow the file system to take a look at, okay, what is in SRC? Now, SRC itself is another directory because it says like, okay, I have directory information. What is the files that you point to? Okay, I have user prog, I have VM, I have threads, and so on, okay? So, and uh, again, like, uh, the, the attributes that the directory can hold for each file is uh, their size, their you know, protection, and the, the location on the disk. These are the, this is the most important one. Um, so, this is also important to know, uh, I mean, if you have, like, programs, uh, you know, to access some directories, you might have, this actually uh, took me some uh, trouble because I was, like, you know, writing program, I was getting information from the operating system to, you know, lo see the files in a directory, and then I expected it to be sorted as it is, is always is, right? But then it was just like uh, acting weird, and then after debugging, I realized for some reason, uh, the list of the files is actually not sorted, because that API in that, uh, you know, programming language was just like getting raw data from the operating system, and the raw data from the raw operating system is not sorted. It's just like, you know, the files that are in that directory, whatever order. And then, for example, when you call ls, the ls command itself, basically, then sorts it for you, right? So, uh, let's see, how, there, how the directories are structured. So the simplest way to think of the directories is like your Pintos, right? We have a root directory which is always accessible, and within that the root directory, it's just like, you know, name of files and the link to the location of the file. Name of the next file, location to the next file. So this is called a single uh, level directory, uh, and that, of course, you know, it's very simple to implement, but the problem is you cannot like have multiple users. You cannot like you know have different files with diff, uh, with, sin, with the same name, right? Uh, and uh, so you cannot organize, you cannot group files, anyways. So this is of course not 
you know, desirable. So the next level is that, okay, let's introduce another level into it and have like at least one directory for each user, right? So the master uh, directory has like, you know, multiple links basically, but each of them are not to a single file. They are to a directory, right? So these are the directories for user one. This is the directory for user two. This is the directory for three and so on. And each of them may contain files, right? So we call like master directory and user directories, for example. Now, in this case, it allows you to actually, you know, separate groups uh, and users from each other. It uh, avoids file and confusion, so you can have like, you know, in each each user can have a different uh, file with the same name, and uh, you know, it's but it's still not enough, right? It doesn't still allow any user to group files or it, like have any logical meaning amongst their their files. So why don't we do the same thing that we just did here? So have a directory that has links to directories instead of file and implement the same thing in these directories. So they can also link to directories. And then it's just like with one step, we, we uh, basically enter the tree level, right? So now we have the root directory, which is always you know, found, but essentially it's the same uh, behavior. So each directory can have links to either directories or files. Right, this one has like, you know, links to directories or files. It doesn't matter. Right? And this is what we are familiar with. Okay? So, it, it basically solves the issues that we want to, uh, whatever that we want to, right? It allows us, first of all, uh, to organize however you want. Like, you know, how you organize your books or, I don't know, spices or whatever, you know, the cabinets you have, you know, and then within them you have shelves. The same exact, like, you know, it's natural that you want to do that and it allows you to do that, right? And then it, uh, but this way, instead of like, you know, it's, it's now not very trivial to find files, right? Because in this scheme, for example, you know where the root level is, and then obviously, just like looking at them, you know where the other ones, and then underneath them, there are all files. That's it. Now, in the tree, if this can link to this directory, and then this can link to another directory, and that can link to another directory, okay, where does it end? Right? So, you have to have like the path names, and so each file has a path name. Starting, it's, it's absolute path name always starts from the root, and then each directory points to the next one. So, you know, from the root, you move to a home directory. After that, you move to OS class. After that, you move to Pintos. After that, you move to SRC. Then lib. Then user. And this is still a directory itself, right? That can lead to now files. Okay? Uh, you can also basically address directories not from absolute path, but from the working directory. So when you are, when you have a working directory, basically, for example, in your shell, your shell already knows where you are, meaning it has a handle to that directory. Okay? So when you open up your shell, it's always at home, right? So instead of like going all the way from, you know, slash home, whatever, you can directly just say, okay, you know, enter this, because it already knows this directory, and then it just like looks under this directory. So it doesn't have to, again, start over. So, for example, in your Pintos directory, you can, you know, we always, in the uh, descriptions of the projects, we use this, right? So, and within the directory themselves, there's always a link to the directory itself and its parent. So you can traverse backwards, right? So that's how you do like cd dot or cd dot dot. Uh, so, any questions on these? What would be the problem if uh, uh, any pro uh, directory can link to any directory? Cycles. Cycles, right? So if any directory is just like pointing to somewhere, like it, and it can be another directory. So what if an, a directory points to a directory which has a point to this directory? So, you know, this can happen, right? And again, when you have it on the disk, this hierarchy is not there. It's just like, you know, links, and, you know. And uh, logically, you can have cycles. And one of the problems with cycles is that whenever you want to, like, look for a file, right, you basically look uh, the files within this directory. And if you couldn't file, recursively, you look for it in the subdirectories, right? And so n what happens here? You look for the root for some file. It's not there. And then you call it on the AVI. 
but before calling it on TS, uh, TC, you probably, you know, it's recursion, right? So in AVI, it looks for it. Uh, it doesn't have the file itself. Um, and it's not this file. It's not this file. And then asks for the count. This count, then it doesn't have the file. So uh, then it calls on the book. Now, the book has a subdirectory. It's AVI. It asks that. And AVI has a subdirectory. It's book. And the book has a subdirectory. It's AVI. And it just, like, takes forever. So... This is a problem with cyclic graphs, and you have to avoid it. So the first idea is, okay, I'm going to like remove uh, cycles, right? So to have an acyclic graph. So acyclic graphs are possible as long as you are keeping it, right? So if you just start from the root directory, and you just create directories, then there won't be any cycle, because you say that, okay, I want to make a directory under the, you know, the dict. And then you say, okay, I want to make a directory under W. So this way you're always asking the operating system to make these directories for you. And because you're already saying who the parent is, uh, you know, it will be under, under that parent. So it will always maintain, uh, you know, acyclic. But the problem is, for example, in Linux, that's not just the case. You cannot, I mean, you can obviously make the directories and ask the operating system to do so. But you also have links, some symbolic links or hard links, right? So, when you can introduce links, then you also can introduce, you know, the cycles. So, and in order to do, uh, to make it a little bit easier, at least for the operating system itself, to traverse directories, it just like ignores the links, right? Uh, because the links are a bit different than the directories themselves. Their, their type is uh, essentially different. So... You know, it allows you to do the links so that, you know, if you wanted to find something, you know where it is, you know, it's linking to. But the uh, operating system itself looks at the AVI and says, oh, AVI is not a directory. It's actually a symbolic link which links to this directory. So I'm not going to traverse it all the way to the book again. I'm just going to ignore that, right? So this way, it doesn't actually end up in that loop, all right? So... How the path name translation is happening. So in your uh, like program, let's say for example, you know, in the Pintos, you have like open this file with the full path and you know, you give also the uh, access type, right? Read, write, append, whatever. So what's, uh, what's exactly happening uh, at this? So you're passing this through a system call which is like open, obviously. Now, the open itself as a kernel, what it does is that it doesn't know where that file is. It doesn't know even that file exists, right? So, how does it, like, look for it in the file system? So, it always starts from either the, you know, if it starts with the slash, goes to the root. If it doesn't start with the slash, it starts from the working directory itself. So, it, it knows where the root is. So, it opens up the root directory and get the list of the files in the root, Within that list, it searches for one, because it has already parsed this, right? You know, one and then separate. So it it expects a one, a file uh, naming one into uh, the root directory. So it looks for you know direct, uh, one, whether it's a file or directory. Then it reads uh, you know that one, retrieves the information, and then finds that okay, you're a directory. Then do you have file number two? or named two. It traverses that and then looks for that two. Uh, after it like finds it, it says, okay, where is two? Because again, each of them is somewhere in the disk. So where is two? That way. It goes again, opens that file, looks for it, like it reads the block, looks underneath the information for three. Do you have, you know, file named three or not? If you have where it is on the disk, then I'm going to look for that. Now I open that up. Are you, you know, uh, can I like, you know, open you with this access type and everything? If so, then it gives, uh, you know, basically stores the information within the uh, kernel through the file descriptors, getting a handle. So then this user can use this FD to access that file directly from now on. It doesn't have to do this all. At, and at any of these points, it basically checks for permission, right? So does the current user, you know, have... Uh, the permission to open this one. It's a directory which, which might be, you know, private to another user. Then, no, you cannot, like, even look for these. 
Okay, it is accessible, but not, you know, writable. So, you know, then you move on. And then, you know, f- finally, you read this file. Okay, can, I, can this user access this? With the, you know, read, yes. Can it access the write? No. All right, so these are basically the levels that you need to know. And starting from the root, just like goes on at each point, it just like, you know, checks the permission. And again, in order to uh, prevent every time of this traversing, you know, from directory to directory, uh, it just like saves the handle after the first opening, so it can like access that file directly. Also, it ca- caches these. So, because for example, home directory is used a lot, right? So, it always like caches the location of the home directory. So, for whatever like uh, files that you are, you know, uh, accessing, they probably are from like slash home, you know, OS class, for example, right? So it already knows where it is, so directly, you know, read that from memory and go it, you know, to save time. So, or if your work directory, working directory is, you know, it has a handle to that, it might cache some of the underlying subdirectories because you might, you know, want to use them. So that depends on the caching, you know, uh, algorithm. All right? Any questions? Hmm? All right. So the implementation of direct, uh, directories. So this is again. So each directory is just a file itself. Now within this file, we have names and locations on the disk. Now we can you know traverse this user A file, go to go to the, here and access this directory, or you know access this directory. Again, each directory itself is a file that contains information which can be linked to directories or files. Which again, in turn, those can be traversed and then the operating system realizes that this is another directory. Now it has like, you know, these files. Now this is like, again, underneath that. Now this is this file. And then obviously it, it can also uh, figure out the path from the, starting from the root. Okay? Uh, yes. Oh, the, well, the folder directory are the same abstraction from the user view. Now, the implementation is different because the Windows and, you know, Linux are just like, you know, implementing them differently. So, we don't know about Windows, I guess it's not open source. And, uh, it, but it should be something similar, right? Because uh, that's just like the logical way to do it in a, in a program, to have, you know, but it, again, it might have different way of addressing, so it might actually have different type of files for each like folder and file, right? So uh, the in the Unix we have like inodes, which each inode like is a unique number for a file, right? And uh, I think like each inode actually can be unique within the partition or device, but that's like a couple of layers below, right? So at this point, we just like think of them. So if you do an ls, you get the list of the files, right? But if you also add the dash i, then it will also show you the inode numbers for each of them. So this dot is current directory, right? You can also replace it in any other directory. Now it says that, okay, I, I want to run ls, and I want to list, you know, uh, instead of like, you know, uh, horizontal list, I want them to, you know, in a complete list, and uh, then uh, I want all the files, even the hidden files, you know, uh, the files that start with dots, they're normally hidden, and then I want to show the, uh, I want you to show me the inode number. Now, ls asks the operating system that, okay, give me the information within the correct directory. This, this itself, uh, it has a handle to this file, reads that file as a directory, and then within that file is the information that this directory holds, right? It says that, okay, the inode to this directory itself is this. The inode of the parent is this. I have a file named, you know, bash history, which the inode this. I have a file uh, bin, which later on, you know, it will be actual folder or directory. But at this point, it says I have, you know, bin and the inode is this, right? So... 
Now, let's see. So from the system view, how, uh, there's no directory anymore. There's no hierarchy anymore, right? It's just like that, you know, each, the, each directory is just like a file with a list of, you know, again, files and directories in it. You know, and I keep repeating this because, you know, that's just like what it is. And the real meaning of when you have like a, a file is in a directory, right? My, like, user prog is within SRC. That just like means from the system view that, okay, SRC is a file that has a link to a file that is called user prog, right? And when you say like, a directory contains a subdirectory, again, the same case, then it's just like the parent directory has a link to the other one. Now, when you say a directory has a parent directory, for example, you say uh, the kernel has the, the, the parent directory of kernel is lib, then that means uh, that this, this has a link, the dot dot link is pointing up, and there is a link from that directory, the parent directory, to this directory. Okay? So, this is just like representation of system. And we're going to, like, you know, we're going to see some of the examples, and uh, you, you, you see. So, when your user view, from your perspective, you have a, you know, a directory, and then each directory now has like, you know, a couple of uh, directories and a file, x, d1, d2, z. So, the representation in the operating system is like this. So, the demo directory has the inode of 865, let's say. Okay. Its parent directory has the inode number of 193. Now, within this directory is another file, or, uh, I mean, another directory, which is called A, with the inode of 277. There is another file, which is called C, it has the inode of 520. Another file is Y, with the inode of 591. Now, the operating system, now, if you look for that inode, right, if you look for this inode, and then it says it doesn't have this, this information anymore. It doesn't have A, it doesn't have demo directory anywhere. It just like has the, this information. Uh, I have a file which is called dot, which itself, and the inode number is 277. I have a parent directory which is represented by a dot dot name, which is 865. You can see this basically points to this one, right? And then I have a file uh, called x, and uh, its location is 402. Now, if the operating system takes a look at this location on disk, it says that, okay, under me, there is a file called dot, and the address is 520. There is a dot dot, which is called 865. And there is like, you know, D1, T2 with these inodes. If you take a look at each of those, again, each of those have a dot and a dot dot, and that's it. They don't have a name of themselves. Okay? Any question here? Because we're going to have a couple of examples on this. I want to make sure that, you know, this is clear. All right, let's go. So, the representation, I mean, the uh, logical view of the same thing will be this, right? So, the operating system is storing data on the disk, which are the tables, not the headers. Like, these are just titles, just to, you know, show which, which, which data it, it is representing. But basically... The demo directory is just like a file which contains this, dot 865, dot dot 193, A, C, and Y. And if you look at that location, like 277 in the memory, again, it's just like another file. It has dot, 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 and X. If you look at, you know, 520 in the disk, it just like has these information. And, you know, this information. So, if you want to traverse a directory, you need a handle to them, I mean, keeping a location on this file, right? And then, if you want to, like, you know, go to the parent of this directory, you basically read this file, you look for the dot dot, you find the inode, you jump to that inode on the disk. Now, you have a pointer or handle to this file. Now, in this file, you want to go to the, you know, the sibling of this, which is, you know, A in this one. So, then you look, you know, at this, looking for A, you find the inode, jump to the inode, Right? So, this, I, I know the, the data structure is basically 
something that holds a met metadata for each of uh, these files or directories. And so again, the inode number itself is a unique ID number. You can just like, you know, call it on your, you want to just to see either like, you know, some small numbers or very large numbers. It has like, you know, 32 bit. So you know, it can uh, vary a lot. And um, now this is uh, another important thing that we're going to talk about. Different files can link to the same inode. So this is something that you probably haven't seen or you don't see in Windows as far as I know, but like in Linux or Unix, basically, you can point to the same file, for example, from different directories. So, if, you know, if you look at it logically, you have like a file name, like let's say my test under like directory A, and you have also a my test under directory B. Normally, you would say, you would think that these are separate, you know, files, so if you modify this file because it's under A, it doesn't, you know, change in the B directory. But if they're actually pointing to the same inode, they're essentially one file. And if you modify it here and read it from there, then you basically, you know, uh, you, you'll see the change. So, uh, the inodes and, uh, you know, absolute paths and IDs uh, are, you know, uh, basically the system works with the inodes because they're unique and they're directly accessible. So, the operating system doesn't need to know the path names, whether, like, when you move a file, for example, from one directory to another directory, it doesn't change, you know, it doesn't actually move any file, it doesn't do a lot. It just, like, removes them from uh, you know, the, the list of that directory and adds it to the list of that directory. That's it. And the file stays wherever it is. The, the inode stays the same, right? And uh, again, if you have a handle to a file, now you still can edit it, modify it. Now, how about the file names? We just realized that uh, the, the directories themselves or the file themselves doesn't have their own names. It's their parent directory that have their names, okay? And so this way, basically, the inodes and the, 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 the locations and the names will become independent. So, if you have a file here, it is only identified by an inode. Now, it doesn't matter what I call this, why you call this, or why you, what you call this. This is one file. I can call it like, you know, class. You can call it, uh, you know, instructors folder. You can call it, you know, just junk, right? It doesn't matter. The data is still the same, and uh, that's accessible by the inode, all right? Now, uh, Again, each directory holds the, uh, what, whatever that it wants to call that file and the address to that file, all right? So, this is a, a structure of an inode. We talked a little bit about the, the block part last session. Uh, we will get to it just to make it a little bit clear, but this, the, for, for now, this directory, for example, is this. And this has a, you know, a file or directory called foo with the address 123. It also has another one, which is this one. Now, if you jump to this location and then look at that, it has an inode, right? So, the inode data struct has the meta, meta information. The meta information is like, what are the permissions? Who is the owner? What are the access times? All these. Remember, we have like one block, right? let's say 512 bytes. Within this 512 bytes is only these. There's no actual information of, you know, the file. So if the user created this file to store hello world, there is no H, there is no E here yet. There is only information about the, this file. So, uh, you know, what is the size of it and how many links are to this file? This is also important. Uh, again, we're going to cover soft links and hard links in a bit. And then, where does this file actually start? Where is the first byte of this file? So, this has the data block, right? So, this is not the inode anymore. This is not the I inode number anymore. This is a, the, the identifier to the block number which the underlying levels of the file system will be able to find, right? You remember last session we, call, we talked about, you know, there are like multi-layers. So, the file system is just like at the top of it. You know, just talking about files, directories, and inodes, whatever. After this, 
There are like multiple levels. There's like LVM. There is uh, like the figure out, figuring out like which physical device it is, and then actually accessing its blocks. So uh, the X, X, X4 or X3 itself is uh, you know still uh, underneath this. We haven't talked anything about like you know data recovery, whatever. So, but it's still like we have like you know a block number that we say okay you know the file starts from this. And then your hello world will start like, you know, in these. And then this file can have one block of data, which is, for example, for a case which is hello world, it's like maybe short. So just like one block will be assigned and then this will be pointing to this. Not, and then these are all uh, not important, right? Either zero or negative one. Now, if you need more data, if the data is larger, it's going to occupy more blocks and then you have like more blocks to assign. It's going to like have more blocks and assign. And then we have like these three. So, let's take a look at them. So, the inode has 16 pointers, or 15 pointers, basically, to data blocks. Last session, we talked about how uh, Unix does multi-level to uh, allow for larger files to exist without wasting a lot of uh, space uh, in the index block itself. So, it has 12 direct data blocks. So, if your file is under... Uh, how, how, like, what is that? Like six kilobyte, I think. Uh, then it can only, like, it will fit in the, the direct data blocks, and then you have the li the link from number one to twelve to them directly. Now, if there is more data blocks to the file, let's say you know you have ten kilobyte of file, right? Then you, your your data blocks will be there, but how you organize and point to them is through indirect blocks. So the f number thirteen is basically a link to another data block. But this data block is not the file's data block. It is the a block of data block numbers or indexes, right? So this points to this and then it has now 128 entries because each number is represented by four bytes and each of these entries can actually point to a data block. So if again, let's say each data block is 512 bytes, so we have 12 of them here, we have 128 of them here, so that's a total of 140 blocks, which is like 70 kilobytes. So if your file is less between 6 kilobytes and 70 kilobytes, then you're going to like use this table. What if you have a file which is larger than that? Well, again, remember, a lot of files are actually very small, right? So by doing direct blocks of, you know, small very tiny, you know, maybe operating system files or important files are directly and fastly, fast access, right? If your file is a little bit larger, then you, you might also either not have the same, you know, frequency of usage or, you know, just like the same, save space. This has been done anyways. So then you have to go through the second block to find, you know, the block numbers. Beyond 70 kilobytes now, and you're here. So I don't have any more space to store here. So what I do is a number 14 basically points to a block that has 128 entries. These 128 entries doesn't actually point to blocks. Each of them point to another block which has 128 entries to data blocks. Right? So this way we have 128 of these here, right? 128 of this, including this one that's 129 of this. Each of them holds 128. So that's 128 multiplied by 129, which is 2 to the power of uh, 14, which is 4 thousands plus 1, 4097 data blocks plus 12, 4000 and uh, it's 5,000 uh, 4, and what is that? Uh, 9? So, again, the number just doesn't matter. I'm just like, you know, g giving you the estimate. Let's say that there are like still 4,000. 4,000 of 512 bytes, that is 2 megabytes, right? I think so. So, but a lot of files are still beyond that. So, what do you do? You add another line. Tri triple and direct. So, the number 15 actually is not even drawn here because it's just like too much, right? 15 is like point to a block. Each of the, those entries is like this one. 
each of those entries will actually point to a block, which each of those entries point to another block, which each of those will actually point to a block. So this will just like, you know, basically expands all the files that you can access. Alright? So, let's see. Going on with the links. Any questions before moving on? Right. At least try to make, make sure that you understand what the, you know, the direct one and then one level and two level indirect links are. Uh, the indexes and then the triple, you know, it doesn't matter. But, you know, it's actually uh, fun to work out the numbers. Okay? So, the links is uh, what, you know, Linux allows you to have separate links to the same files or, you know, links to different directories at different locations. So, you might have seen them, for example, if you do ls, they might show up in, you know, blue color or you have when you do ls, it actually gives you a list, but then in front of that file, there is like an arrow pointing and then another address, okay? So, these are like, you know, links, uh, and then there are two types of links in Linux. One is a hard link, and then one is soft link or symbolic link. So, uh, the hard link actually creates another file with a link to the same underlying inode. So, this is, let's say you have... Uh, in, in your directory, let's say, you have, you know, uh, myfile.txt. So, what does it do? The myfile.txt actually is just a name and an inode number within your current directory, right? So, when you do ls, your directory has a pair, which is, has this name and a location, which is this inode. So, the data stored in that, you know, file is actually here. So, that's not going to, like, you know, go away. It's just going to keep it. If you rename your file, it's just going to rename the name within the directory. It doesn't actually have to change anything here. Okay? Now, if you make a hard link to this file, it basically creates another file that has the link to the same inode. So, and you create links through the command ln. Right? In the Linux, if you call ln myfile.txt, my hard link, you are creating another file within the directory. So, you know, if you now you do an ls, you see my file txt pointing to this inode. You also see my hard link with the same inode. So, now, this might not be, you know, in the same directory. You can now move this to a different directory. So, now, you know, again, that's the same example that I said. From two different directories, two files with different names pointing to the same actual data. So, if you change one of them and then read from the other one, you actually see the change. Now, the symbolic links or soft links are different, basically. They don't actually point to the inode. They point to the file itself, like, you know, the representation here. So, they only point to the address here. So, if you create uh, the soft link using ln-s, it creates a soft link to this file and then names it like this. So, when you do like ls, it doesn't actually have uh, the uh, inode of this file, uh, inode of this. It just has the address of this. Right? It has a different inode. Whenever you create the soft link, it basically has a different inode. It doesn't point to this. It points to the link itself, which has the address of this. So, the usage of hard links and soft links are, you know, different. And you might not actually, you know, use them. Uh, but it's just like that. Um, for example, a soft link can make it easy for you to have, a, like, a shortcut. So, let's say you want a shortcut from your home directory to your Pentos SRC user prog process.c. Right? Uh, I mean, let's say to the directory, to the user proc directory. So, whenever you call, you know, from your home directory, you open up the terminal, instead of like calling cd pintos group whatever, pa2, uh, src, user proc, instead of that, you just want to say, okay, I want cd uh, pa2, that's it. Okay? So, then you can create a soft link to that directory. So, this soft link is actually creating an inode for itself, and then within that inode, it has the address of that. So then when you call CDPA2, the operating system basically just, you know, grabs that path and then opens that up for you. 
which is then there. Uh, hard links, I like. I, I cannot like make a useful example right now, but uh, it's just like has, uh, has the link to the same inode. So one thing, for example, with the soft link is that if you have a soft link that is linking to a file and then you move that file or rename this file, the soft link is invalid. And if you do it like you do it uh, with a ls, you test it with a when you ha make the soft link, he, it is uh, showing as like you know color blue, and then when you rename that file, the link will become invalid, and then it will basically show in red because now the link is you know basically not attaching to anywhere. S hard link, on the other hand, actually doesn't care. So the hard link is a file to the same inode. If you rename this file, it doesn't care. If you even remove this file, it doesn't care. It still points to the same inode. And this is one of the important things for hard links. So the inode we saw here keeps the number of hard links to a file. Right? Because the inode is, you know, holding the data. Now, who is pointing to the hard link? Uh, sorry, to the, uh, the inode. It is the actual hard links. See, if if the soft link is looking at this file only, and uh, only this file is pointing to this inode. If I remove this file, the inode is inaccessible. There is no way that you can actually point to this inode anymore. This link will be invalid to one file, even if you just rename this file. This will be invalid. And now the inode is just like, you know, basically freed. Right? However, if you have like a make a hard link to this inode, now this inode is basically accessed by two links. One is this one and one is this one. Maybe from different locations, maybe from different users, right? So because of that, the number of hard links to file is stored within the, within the inode itself. So when you, for example, remove this file, it actually checks the, this inode and then reduces the number of links to this file. But now it says, oh, it's not zero. Someone else, I don't know how, where, it has access to this inode. So I cannot just remove the inode itself, the file itself. Right? It, uh, it is removed from you know, that directory. My file is no longer listed in that directory anymore. But someone else has you know, a file with a different name, but has a link to this inode. So that's the uh, inode counts. Alright? Any questions? I wanted to leave some time for questions. So, yeah, basically this is what I went over. So, uh, the link count is a member of struct stat. So, if instead of like ls, you call a stat on a file or directory, it gives you some information about that, uh, the stat, uh, struct stat, and the number of hard links to the file is one of those, right? So, uh, if we have, I mean, I'm actually booted into my Windows, but I can basically boot my virtual uh, box, but it takes some time, so you know, just go on and try it on your Ubuntu. Uh, you know, do ls, do with the inode, check out the inode number, what it, they represent, uh, make a temporary directory, make a couple of files in them, make a symbolic list, make a hard link, um, and you know, change the file name, see what happens, move the file, see what happens, move the link, see what happens. That's just like, you know, uh, to help you understand about the links. If you don't want to use them, it's fine. Alright? So, now, what will happen in the directory when you create one of these? This is in a kind of like an exercise example to see. So, when you copy demo directory AX to demo directory CX copy, what happens? From the system's perspective, someone tells me what this does. From all that we, we have learned about like inodes, Files, directories, lists, go ahead. Mm -hmm. yeah. It not only duplicates the inode, it duplicates the whole file. All the data blocks will be copied. Uh, a new inode will be generated for this, which contains different, probably, you know, information. For example, this file is now different time, right? You might have it on a different location, which inherits its permissions from its parent, for example, you know, such that. Or uh, now, 
and then obviously uh, we have uh, we under the name of uh, the under the directory C itself we uh, add another uh, another file name right now we create a file name x copy under the directory C which points to that inode which we just like created so what about the let's say going and move if I move demo directory y to demo directory a y what's going to happen The one from here. Even make a guess. Huh? Yes, what this does. What what does it do? Moving the file Y from demo directory to demo directory Y. A. Yes. Yeah. It basically doesn't change any data block. It doesn't change any inode. It just like looks at the demo directory, which is like, you know, it has to have the, have, have the hand, handle. It looks for the list of the pairs of inodes and files under it. And then once it fi finds the num uh, like file name A, it just removes it from the list. And then goes into, like looks for the A underneath the demo directory. And then... Uh, basically opens that location, which like now is like A, and then looks at underneath there, and then adds Y. I mean, and it also does a couple of checks. So, for example, if Y is the already there, it should not do it, or ask for permission, whatever. If it cannot do this, then it won't remove it from this directory, you know, in the first place. So, the order also matters, but uh, overall it does that. When you create a li link like that, so the X link, when you create this X link, you create a data block, basically, which is uh, holding the path to this file. You create an inode. You give the pair of xlink and that inode to the directory one. If you create... Uh, oh, sorry, that was about the soft link. Now, a hard link, if you create this, you actually give the same inode that is represented by x under directory a. You, you take the same inode and you basically go to the directory one and put the same inode number with the name x link there. You don't create any data, you don't create any inode, nothing. Okay? And then you increase the hard links count within that inode. Okay? Because now there's like access by well, more than one. Okay? So, uh, this is another example. So the PW, I'm going to wrap up in a couple of, I mean, Three minutes. Hold on. So, how, like the PW is like a working directory. How to find the working directory? It's, this is like a, important. You, you want the full path to your current directory. It doesn't hold it beforehand. You only handle, uh, you, you keep a handle to this file. So, how does it know that this file is from a slash demo directory CD2? It doesn't know, actually. It has to traverse back and forth. So, it doesn't know what is the name of this folder itself. It says, okay, this is 247. What my parent does call me? It goes to the parent and then search for the 247 and says, oh, my parent is calling me D2. Okay, I'm D2. So what is my parent's name? It goes to here and says, okay, my parent's inode is 520. What is their parent calling them? So it's going to go in there, look for 520, and then says, oh, their parent is calling them C. So what is their name? Uh, their inode is 865. Uh, Let's see what the, their parent is calling them. It goes to the inode 193 and then looks at their list looking for this number and then, oh, they call them the module, right? This is the way that they do it. And this traversing, you know, takes a bit of a time and obviously, you know, that's what the PWD does, right? So, this is basically what I just said. You know, just make sure you read it at home. And go on with the syscalls. Complete more, like you have to implement more than one syscalls uh, by the end of the weekend. Like, you know, halt, exit, be done with them. You have a lot of debugging. All right? Autograder is open. Make uh, your groups finalized and start submitting on it.